the book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. This is the first Old Testament book that I've preached from the pulpit. I've taught it on Wednesday nights, but this is the first Old Testament book that I'll be preaching from the pulpit on Sunday mornings. And if you're joining us for the first time, we just go through the Bible. We're going to go through the whole book of Malachi. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And Malachi is a lot like James. He digs into it really hard. But he starts off with a wonderful foundation for us to start with this morning. A message I entitled, Returning to Love. Returning to Love. Malachi chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 1. Let's stand to honor the word of God. Malachi chapter 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes once again to just see a fresh vision of Jesus, to be refreshed with the love of Christ, the fellowship of brothers and sisters. And we pray, Lord, that we would leave this place, Lord, more in love with you than when we came in. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Often, when you get a call to be a pastor, you go through training. And one of the classes that usually that they sort of make you go through is theology. And theology is pretty silly, to be honest with you, because the actual term theology is theos, God, the study of God. Little finite brains like mine are going to study God. Hmm? Again, the whole thing is, but there's a purpose to it because God has revealed himself to us. And there's been great theologians throughout our t lifetime, many people. One of those theologians was a Swiss theologian named Karl Barth. And if you ever go to a pastor's library or any library, you can see books like, these books are like yay thick on theology, right? And they said, sir, I think I told you this before, can you boil down your theology into two sentences for us? Two sentences, volumes, two. He said, yes, I can. It is what I learned on my mother's lap when I was a little boy. He said, Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And that is what Malachi today is speaking to the people of Israel, and he speaks to us today. He says, return to my love. The key verse in the book of Malachi, I didn't put it on the board. You may want to make a note of it. If there's one key verse in this book, it's chapter 3, verse 7. The book says this, return to me, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. What does God say to unbelievers in the book of Isaiah? He says, turn to me and live. What does he say to believers in Jesus Christ? What does he say to the nation of Israel? Time after time after time after time after time again. He says, return to me. He's saying to America, I believe today, 2023, return to me. What is happening in our world? I think God is saying, Return to me. Come back to your first love. He calls his people today in the book of Malachi to return. And you say, to return from what? Glad you asked. Well, a little history on the book of Malachi. Malachi was written approximately 430 B.C. It's God's final word to his people. His final word before what? 400 years of silence. That blank page in your Bible that separates the Old Testament and the New Testament, that represents 400 years of silence. 
before what? Before John the Baptist, that wild man, comes on the scene and says, I'm a voice of one in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. So here is the last words to Israel. So these are important words. It's the final word. What's happening at this time? What's the context? Okay, here we are. Israel went to Babylon, remember? 70 years of captivity. They are now back in Jerusalem. They have rebuilt the temple. They have the wall that Nehemiah built surrounding the city gate, or the city walls are built. So here they are, temple built, wall built, and guess what happened? The people grew complacent in their love for God, and they grew corrupt in their dealings with one another. What has happened in the book of Malachi, what happens in many places today is things start to go good, and then complacency is like a disease that comes in and it rots from the inside out. People just start just sitting back and saying everything is good, and we get really complacent. And the idea here of Malachi's message is the people lost their heart for God, they lost fear of God, and what happened? They just started going through the motions. Here we go, we're just going through the motions. Sing a song, preach a sermon, sing a song, preach a sermon, come to a prayer meeting, and it just goes on and on. They had a form of worship, but they did not have the heart of worship. And God says to them, return to me. You want a fun study to do. Compare the book of Malachi, the last word to Israel, to the last words of the church, to the churches from Jesus Christ in the letters that he pens in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. In a very, very similar message is happening in both of them. I entitled this message series called Get Serious. Malachi says, I want you guys to get serious. And it's constructed like this. He has six arguments that take the form, in a, di a form of a dialogue. It's a banter back and forth. God asks them, or they ask God a question. God responds, and they respond. It's this dialogue back and forth between the people and God through this book. And he says, I want you to get serious. What's he say? Get serious about what? I want you to get serious about worship. I want you to get serious about marriage. He's going to talk about that. I want you to get serious about the fear of God. I want you to get serious about giving to the work of the ministry. And today he says, in a beautiful few words, I want you to get serious about God's love. About God's love. Church, if we don't have love, all we are going to be left with is lukewarm worship, flowing from a lukewarm heart, and it's just going to be a bunch of cold formalism where we're just punching in and punching out, going through the motions, doing our thing, and there's not going to be any passion, any heart behind it. Because what's the Bible about? It is a love letter to you and to me. God's amazing love. You can boil it down. It's so simple, guys. I told the worship team, this is simple today. It is simple. What does the Bible say? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. If I don't have love, I am nothing. What's it mean? It means you can be as theologically correct as you want to be. You could have the loudest worship team you could have. You can go do this. And if you don't have love, you might as well take the eraser and just erase it all. Guys, this is the call. Come back to love. Why do we love? Why do we love? The Bible says that we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. What's the greatest commandment? I remember the kids standing up here last week. Do you remember? What did they say? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You can just take the entire Bible and just summarize it in those two verses. Guys, it's about 
love. Three things I want to consider in this few verses with you about God's love. God is going to make an amazing exclamation, number one, of his love for you and for me. Second, the people are going to make a miscalculation about God's love. And then the third thing, God is going to, re, he's going to correct their thinking about God's love. So there's an exclamation of his love, there's an evaluation, and there's an explanation. Let's get into it. This is my favorite part, guys. I hope it's your favorite. I hope you've got a pencil or got a marker. If you mark up your Bible, this is a good one to mark up today. Verse 1, you ready for this? Let this hit your heart really hard this morning. If you come in here burdened, weighed down, heavy laden, let it go. Here's the word of the Lord, not Derek's word, God's word. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, says the Lord. There it is. The God of the universe has written to you and to me, I have loved you. I have loved you. Guys, we can't forget that. We can't take that for granted. Listen, it starts with a burden. He says, this is a burden of the word. Man, he says, this is coming to me with a heavy heart, with heaviness. And if you've come in here heavy, do you know one thing that will lift that burden more than anything else? It's not a theological discourse on eschatology and end times and rapture. The one thing that will lift your burden today, church, is the love of Jesus Christ and the love of God for you. And God says, I have loved you. And I believe that somebody here in the congregation needs to hear that word today. God loves you. He loves you. This word here says, I have loved you. It means I have loved you. I do love you. I will always, always love you, says the Lord. That's how he starts off. <coughs> Friends, this is the foundation of everything else. Before Malachi digs into correcting and disobedience and worship and marriage, he says, this is the springboard from which everything else is going to flow in this letter, this dialogue, God's love. Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. Say that verse with me, church, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Man. Listen, our failures, our faults, they may bring consequences, and they do. Trust me. They may bring divine discipline, and they do. Trust me. But one thing they will not do, no matter how bad you failed, no matter how much you have just blew it, listen, it does not lessen the love of God for you this morning. Okay? It doesn't lessen his love. He loved me in the gutter. He loved me in the pew. Okay? He loved me as a sinner. He loves me as a saint. He loves me in the valley. He loves me in the mountain. God loves us, guys. No matter what I do, it's not going to waver God's love for me because God is love. I want you to hear this this morning, especially young people. There is nothing I or you could do that could make you or make God love you any more or any less than he already does. Nothing. You can't serve in a church and God's going to love you more. That's not how that works. You fail and you falter in sin and God's going to say, no, I'm not really not loving him anymore. No. He says, I love you. And nothing I can do, nothing you can do can change God's love for you. Hear the word of the Bible from Jeremiah 31, verse 3. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Everlasting. How long is everlasting, church? It's forever. Forever. From the time of the womb, before the womb, he loved you. And he's going to love you into eternity. Is this love conditional? Absolutely not. There's no strings attached to it. It's not like he's going to all of a sudden cut the string and say, ah, oh, I don't love you anymore. That's not how it works. 
Our human love is fickle, isn't it? We have fickle love sometimes. If you're doing what I like and everything's going my way, I love you a lot. Now, if you are rubbing me the wrong way and you are just agitating me and you're just hitting me like this, I'm not going to love you so much. That's human love. That's fickle love. That's not the love of God, though. God's love changes not because God changes not. We're going to hear that later in the book of Malachi. Friends, he is the God of love. And that love is the same yesterday. That love is the same today. And that love will be the same forever. He is a God of love. That's God's exclamation point of love today. Let that circle in your Bible. If you take anything home today, I want you to take that home. God says, I love you. Well, the people, they got a problem. God says, I love you. Well, the people, they have a miscalculation. Look at verse 2. They evaluate God's love in a horrible way. Look at that. Yet you say, hmm, they're talking to God. In what way have you loved us? Huh. Okay. Malachi, God's talking to a very cynical, skeptical, godless people, much like today. Much like today. Here's the point, though. How many people have thought that in their head? I've thought that at times. Do you really love me? Like, see, we don't verbalize it like they're verbalizing, but we think that. Um... I'm going through this. See, the people weren't maybe having the, the greatest of time. Things might have not been the ideal situation. And they say, they look around at the circumstance. It's sort of not, not the ideal situation. And they say, I don't think you really love us. Because look at, look at this. Look at that. How many people have done that? I think about the audacity of these people for a moment. God just delivered them out of captivity out of Babylon. He just provided everything they needed for a temple. He just had them build a wall to protect their city. And now they're questioning God's love for them. What's going on? They had God's presence. They had God's protection. They had everything they could want. Why did they question God's love? Malachi says this. We need to return from looking at God's love based on our present situation, our present circumstance, okay? Let me remind you again where we are in history. They have the temple. They are back from Babylon. They're in Jerusalem. But who's ruling and reigning right now? The Persian Empire has their thumb pressing down on them right now, okay? The Persian Empire is pressing down, and they have a temple. But this second temple isn't like Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple was this beautiful, magnificent structure. And if you read the book of Nehemiah, a lot of the older people said, that saw Solomon's temple said, this temple's second rate. This temple's really not what Solomon did. This is an, we're, we're dealing with a second rate temple. We're dealing with, you know, not really true worship. And they were actually weeping over it. It would be like this. If this place burnt down, God forbid, and everything was lost, okay, and we had to go to a barn, and we were, we were doing church in a barn, and we had people here, man, there's no stage, there's no pulpit, there's no stained glass, this really just isn't right. This is what was happening in their day, guys, and they're like, if you really loved us, we wouldn't be dealing with this. Gideon had the same problem, didn't he? Gideon, God comes to Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6, and he says, God is with you, mighty man of valor. Gideon's question says this, chapter 6, verse 13 of Judges, if you are with us, why has all this happened to us? If you're with me, if you love me, have we ever said that? If you love me, Lord, why has my spouse left me? If you loved me, Lord, why did my child get sick? If you love me, why did I lose my job? If you love me, Lord, why is my teenager going down a dark path? If you love me, Lord, why don't I have any money in my bank account? If you love me, Lord, 
Why is all this happening? Have we ever said that? This is the trap that we can fall into when we look at God's love based on just what is happening to our life right now. And it goes like this. If things are going good in my life, God loves me. If things are going bad in my life, God doesn't love me. No, we've already established God's love does not change. I said it before. We see a piece of the jigsaw. We might even see a corner of the jigsaw puzzle. God sees the entire jigsaw puzzle put together, every piece in its place. Do you know who struggled with this back in the Bible, New Testament? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Remember that family in the book of John? The gospel tells us that Jesus loved them. But Jesus waited, and Lazarus died, and Lazarus was in the tomb four days. And when Jesus came to him, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, they said this, the two sisters, Lord, if you really cared about us, you would have came immediately. Mm. What did they see? They saw a piece of the puzzle what was Jesus going to do? He had a greater situation. He was going to do a greater miracle, and he was actually going to raise the dead, not just heal the sick. But they only saw a piece of the puzzle. Lord, if you really cared, we cannot look at our situation and say, God doesn't love me because I'm going through this right now. What does the Bible say? That God's ways are higher than our ways. His, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So if you're in a situation today, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's physical, maybe it's relational, and you're tempted to say this, God's not working, God doesn't love me, I want you to know this today, church, he is working, he does love you, and I want you to know this, that the greater your problem, the greater the opportunity for God to work and God to do a miracle in it. The greater the opportunity I want to say this at the end of this, guys. Listen, we must never view God's love through the lens of circumstances. We must never view the, God's love through the lens of circumstance. We must view circumstances through the lens of God's love. Do you understand that? We must view circumstances through the lens of God's love. In other words, something's gonna, if something happens to me this week, something's going to happen to you this week, maybe, okay? You cannot say, you have to look at that circumstance through the lens of God's love, not vice versa, okay? Well, the people said, God said, I love you. Well, the people say, how have you loved us? Well, God's going to give them a little explanation now. Here comes, the Lord's going to come back on them now. This is what I want you to do. I want you to return to looking at what I've done in the past in your life, okay? Go back to history. Go back to your story. That's what we sang this morning, right? This is my story. This is my song. Every single person in here has a story to tell. And it started, I don't know for you, but it, it started from day one. Well, here we go. Israel had a story. Look at verse uh, 2. End of it. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. God chimes in. He says, hey, in case you forgot something, and they did, they had spiritual amnesia, right? They forgot something. Hey, remember what I did in the past? Do you remember that? We have to go back to the past. And I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are probably thinking, there's that God of the Old Testament. You see that? He said he hated Esau. That's that mean God of the Old Testament, that wrathful, vengeful God. Put the brakes on for a second. God does not hate people. This word hate is not like our word hate where we have this emotional hatred towards people, this vengeful hate. This is not the word that is being used here. This is a comparative word that is being used to compare something. He's comparing Esau and Jacob, his affection for Jacob and his affection for Esau. 
The Amplified Bible puts it best. Hear these words. It puts it better. Yet I have loved Jacob, but in comparison with my love for Jacob, I hated Esau. Comparative. Jesus does the same thing in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Remember he said, if you want to follow me, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your mother, your brother, and your children. What's Jesus saying there? He's, is he saying that you have to hate your kids? Absolutely not. We know that, right? He's saying, listen, your love for me has to burn so hot, so passionate, so intense, that even your love for your children pales in comparison to your love for me. That's what he's saying, guys. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I sh listen, I chose to set my affection on Jacob and not Esau. Who's Jacob? Jacob, the son of Isaac. Jacob's name would eventually be changed to Israel. Okay? Jacob would have 12 sons, which would become the 12 tribes of Israel. He says, Jacob, I have chosen. Esau, I have rejected. And people say, oh, here we go. This divine sovereignty, this divine prerogative, God's choosing somebody and rejecting somebody else. And I have a problem with that. I used to have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that because I just let God be God now. God can do whatever God wants to do. He can choose who he wants to choose, and he can reject who he wants to reject. And God does what he wants to do. And a student came to Charles Spurgeon about this passage the one time. And he said to Spurgeon, he said, I can't understand why God says he hated Esau. Spurgeon replied to him, I have a greater problem with answering why God would love Jacob. Because if you know anything about Jacob's life, he was a wreck too. He was a deceiver. He was shady too. He was not a perfect saint. So the problem is not with him hating Esau, but why in the world would he love Jacob? You see how that works? Question, why did God love Jacob? Why did God love Israel? Why did he love them? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8. It says this, not because you were the greatest, not because you were the best nation in the world, but simply because I chose to love you. Why did God in the Garden of Eden, remember the Garden of Eden, Adam sinned, and there Adam and Eve are hiding with their, the fig leaves of the flesh all over them. They're trying to cover themselves up. What on God's green earth would cause God to go seeking after Adam and Eve? What was in Adam? What was in Israel? What's in us that God would come after seeking us? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing good in me that God would seek after me. There was nothing good in Adam. There was nothing good in the nation of Israel. God says, I just chose to love you. Does that blow your mind a little bit? That blows my mind a little bit. He chose to love me. Even when I was in rebellion to Almighty God. When did he choose to love you? Before you were even born. He chose to love you. Before you were in the womb, I loved you. Look back at history. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did he die for us, church? While we were singing his praises in a church? No. He died for you and me when we were in total rebellion against Almighty God love, guys. Guys, before we were ever born, God sent his son to die for us on a cross. We cannot get too familiar with the cross. It becomes our, it becomes our common tongue in the church, and it should, but we, familiarity breeds contempt. We become so familiar with it, it loses its power in our heart to change us, guys, if you forget that God loves you, if you ever doubt that God loves you, look at his hands. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, I have engraven you on the palms 
of my hands. And how did he engrave you on the palms of his hands? With an iron Roman spike that was driven by a soldier, a centurion, that was peeled to a wooden cross. And he did it because he loved us. Guys, God said, hey, don't you forget, I have loved you in the past. So don't take your present circumstance and say, I don't love you. Because I have loved you, I do love you, and I always will love you. Somebody said this, we value something or someone. Our value for someone or something is based on how much one is willing to spend for it. Listen, God was willing to spend the blood of his own precious son for you me. That's costly. That's precious. That's worthy of a hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ on my life. Henry Blackaby, a Christian writer, he said, when God wants to prove his love, despite what the health and wealth people say, he said this, how does he do it? He does it totally outside of my life. He does it not through promotions, not through health, not through riches, not through riches. He says, look to the cross. Look to the cross. When God wants to prove his love for you, he says, look to a hill called Calvary, where our Savior died and bled for thee. Second thing, guys, God corrects. He says, I want you to look at what I've done in your life in the past. But I also want to look, he says, I want you to look at the plan I have for you. I have a plan for you. Look at verse 3 to 5. There's a future to be had, guys, even though Edom, let me explain that for a moment. Maybe some of you don't understand Edom. Edom is the nation from the descendants of Esau. So you see Esau and Edom used interchangeably a lot of times in your Bible. Edom is the nation that was descended from Esau, okay? Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Okay, they doubted God's love because of their predicaments. They doubted God's love because they forgot their history. And they doubted God's love because they forgot their destiny. God says, Edom, I'm going to push down. I'm going to press down. I'm not going to let him build up. He's going to be pressed down. And you say, why is God saying that about this nation of Edom? We, Hebrews gives a little bit of commentary on Esau. Esau is a fascinating study. The book of Hebrews tells us that Esau was a profane and godless man. And the Old Testament tells us that the nation of Edom was, they harassed the nation of Israel. They were a thorn in Israel's side. So what happened was Edom opposed God. Israel, Jacob, was for God. Edom said, look, I'm going to build up and I'm going to do this. And God said, no, you won't. You are going to be pushed down. You will not build up. You're going to be thrown down. And listen, those who oppose Almighty God have no future. They have no future. The only future that they have is in a place called hell, eternally separated from God forever. That is the only future someone has if they're opposing God today. Are you opposing God or are you for God? Because Jesus said you can't straddle the fence. There's no gray area. You're either for me, you are against me, you either sow with me or you scatter with me. Which one are you for? Are you Esau opposing? Are you Jacob? Are you for me? Israel was, was, they were restored after captivity. Edom was not. Edom was not. If you doubt God's love, Church, I want you for a moment 
to look to the future. And the way you look to the future, I've done this on he- in Hebrews for I don't know how many months now. Brad, months? I don't know. You take the glasses of faith and you put them on. And you read your Bible. And what you see is this. I have a future. Not as something of my own making. But God's word declares to me that I have a future. I have a hope. He has a plan for me. The plan is good. He says, hey, I have promises for you. I have peace I want to give you. I have joy that I want to put into your life. I have riches that I want to give to you in heaven. He says, there's a redeemed family waiting for you. How many are waiting to see their loved ones in heaven? Amen? That's going to be a glorious day, right? Those loved ones who've gone to be with Jesus Christ, we are one day going to be reunited. You have a future there. How about that? How about this? Anybody's body's hurting today? You got a body that's breaking down? Huh? He says, you're going to have a new body one day at the resurrection. Don't forget that, church. He says, you're going to have a family reunion. You're going to have a body that's resurrected. It's not going to be fallen like this one. It's going to be perfect. And guess what else? There's going to be a restored universe. You see this stuff? You see cancer? You see this? You see war? You see famine? You see drought? He says, guess what? That's all going to be wiped away. He said in Revelation, all things will become new. I gave this to Travis to this, this week, and I had to give it to a couple other people. People are passing away, guys. People are passing away, but here's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to this. This is your future. This is my future. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. No eye has seen it. Think about the most beautiful scene you ever, whenever you went on vacation, it was the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. It can't even touch it. The most beautiful piece of music you ever heard. Nothing. Nothing can compare to it, guys. Friends, the Bible says that whoever believes in God shall not be disappointed. God's word to us this morning, he says, I have loved you. God's work on the cross has demonstrated his love for us. And there's a future to come. The world that is to come assures us of his love. As the worship team comes up, guys, let's think about that. Just let that soak in for a moment. As we sing this song, it's how he loves us. Let the words just, let them go into you guys today. Let it go in. And I want, I want you to go out of here, and especially after we come to the communion table, just stand in awe of his love. When's the last time we just stood in awe of his love? Man, I just, let's just pray it out this morning. Heavenly Father, you know, Paul said in the book of Ephesians that We pray that we would know the the length, the depth, the height, the width of the love of God, which is beyond comprehension, Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your words this morning. I think we all just needed to hear those words this morning. That you love us. It's so beautiful. It's so simple. It's so... So we just can't even understand it, Lord. Father, not only have you declared it, you've demonstrated it, and you continue to demonstrate it in our lives, Lord. Grace upon grace, mercy upon mercy, blessing upon blessing, you pour out on your people every day, Lord. I pray, Lord, today, Lord, would you just rekindle as we go through, we begin this new book of the Bible, just rekindle our love for you, Lord, (laughs) afresh. Maybe we've grown complacent in our ways. We just started going through the motions, Lord. I just want to pray that we come back to that place where 
our hearts again are just burning on fire for you, Lord. And that we would love you and love one another as you called us to. And I pray, Lord, for anybody here today, Lord, has not responded to that love, that today would be the day where they hear the words of Almighty God saying, I loved you like a son. I loved you like a daughter. Come to my love. Receive my love. Turn away from your sin and come to the Father's arms. And I pray, Lord, for, for believers today, Lord, maybe, maybe we've just grown cold, Lord. I pray that today would be a day where you come forward just to say, Lord, I want to burn fresh for you. I want my love to come back, Lord. I remember that place when I first got saved. I was so excited. And now, now I'm just, I'm just cold, Lord. That today would be a day where there's a fire that's reignited, Lord. And we pray that you would do it all by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name. you'd like to stand and join us, we're going to sing How He Loves.
won't see these next words on the screen. I didn't know who you were, but you came to me and you changed my whole world. The love I needed, you seeded in me. I didn't deserve it, but you set me free. And oh, how you love me, oh. Loves. 